Oh my gosh. I have seen so many movies this year. So many movies. I've gone to the theater 22 times this year, which is the same number as I did all of 2023. So this is pretty crazy for me. Uh, uh, I've, that's 2023 was like the highest number I've ever gone to a theater at all. Uh, but I've only seen 16 2024 releases. So today I wanted to stop and rank all 16 2024 releases that I have seen for the first half of 2024. Um, so by the way, in the description, there's going to be a list of all the movies that I saw this year. So you can go and you can look at all the movies in order that I saw them. Um, so some of them, you know, maybe good. So, uh, anyways, let's go ahead and get started with number 16, The Watchers. Um, this movie is, uh, Isham, Ishana Knight Shyamalan, uh, the daughter of M. Night Shyamalan. This is her directorial debut. And it's a, it was an interesting concept that's, um, you know, watching the trailers, it got me interested enough to go to the theater to see it. But I don't think this movie really delivered on the intrigue that I was hoping for. Um, the characters weren't all that fleshed out and kind of have to say that the uh, reveal at the end wasn't as interesting as I would have wanted. So um, this one kind of went down lower on the, the, it's at the bottom of the list. Um, I can't really say I really hate any of these movies that are on the list. Some of them I have a few complaints, especially towards the bottom. Um, but for the most part, I did kind of enjoy it. This one, I, th I think I rated this one as a 6 out of 10. So it's not really, like, really low or anything like that. It was kind of like, I was entertained for a while I was watching it. That was kind of interesting. Probably won't ever rewatch it. So, uh, number 15, we have Civil War. Now, this one, I believe a lot of people I know enjoyed Civil War. But for me, the biggest problem with it was the lack of world building. Um, for me... In American Civil War, it's like, okay, this is a fascinating concept. Um, I'm really appreciative that they didn't do, like, that they didn't involve, like, modern American politics. And I'm like, fantastic. But then they also didn't bother explaining the world that you're in. Um, they didn't really bother explaining it. So they didn't really, and I was kind of disappointed because I'm like, there's just, especially a few different times where it's like, I didn't know what to think of this situation because I didn't know the political background or why things were happening. And when you, when you have California and Texas teaming up, there needs to be some explanation here. Um, part of me wonders if a non-American wrote some of this because like, if you're an American, California and Texas teaming up does not make any sense. And so I want an explanation for why that is or why, what the state of the world. Um, and like they, they clearly had some of that writing done because they showed for like, like a second a map that had like four or five different factions. And it's like, whoa, what's going on here? It's not just like simply like two states separating off and finding it. It's not that. So um, because of all that, all the lack of world building, that's where all the intrigue was there for me. And they didn't have it. So that's why it's at number 15. Uh, number 14 was A Quiet Place Day One. This is the most recent movie on the list. And I'm sure a lot of Quiet Place fans are going to place this much higher on their list. But for me, I, I don't know. I, I just, maybe just the intrigue is just not there for me. Maybe this is just not my franchise. I haven't seen the first A Quiet Place or second one. Um, so I, I just, I didn't really have much of an interest in the movies, but I decided to go see this one and it didn't win me over. Uh, I had fun with it. I didn't, I have no real complaints about A Quiet Place Day One. It just, I'm just like, it just wasn't for me. Um, so that's why it goes a little bit lower. Uh, number 13, Godzilla Kong A New Empire. Uh, this movie, like these movies, terrible terrible movies when it comes to like the writing for the like the humans and everything like that it's super stupid but very entertaining uh fights and i place this one out of all the godzilla and kong movies uh from monsterverse and whatnot i consider this one the best um because it's got like the best action to me all the storylines are super stupid the better action is the better movie for me because they're all dumb and, um, but this one, of course, just, you know, there's so many good movies on this list that it just kind of goes a little bit lower. Uh, number 12 is the Mean Girls 2024 remake. Um, this one is the, is a basically 20 years later 
right? Uh, it's not like a sequel or anything like that. It's a 20 year later remake of Mean Girls as a musical. It's kind of like a uh, remake of, like a theatrical, uh, I guess more of a theatrical movie version of a Broadway show, I guess? I guess. Um, I don't know. I have never seen that. But um, I personally enjoyed this movie. I actually really did. You know, I liked some of the songs, you know, so a lot of the visuals were really cool. And um, I know some people don't really think that, like, I'm like, okay, there's an argument that it doesn't really need to exist, sure. But um, it definitely did feel distinct enough and more modern than the 2004 version, um, just because there's so much technology that has changed. And it definitely doesn't incorporate that and kind of changes the story. I really like this one. Um, and then number 11 is Bad Boys Ride or Die. Uh, I, this one, this is the only Bad Boys movie I have seen. And I kind of feel like, I kind of feel like I was missing a lot from the first three Bad Boys movies. I think there's a lot of context I was missing. Not really too sure because I haven't seen all those movies. Um, this one was just, it was a, it was a fun ride. It was enjoyable. It was fun. Nothing too crazy or anything like that. Can't compare it to the rest of the Bad Boys franchise. Um, it, it was like, it was, oh yeah, we've got some action. We've got some comedy in there. Yeah, it was fun. It was enjoyable. I liked it. Number 10, Boy Kills World. This one was a really interesting movie. I think it's a pretty low budget movie. Uh, I don't think it really made much. Uh, and I don't think most people really know about this movie. Uh, it's a very crazy, wacky action movie, R-rated action movie about a boy who can't talk. And so he's got this uh, like video game character narrator in his head who does like most of like the narration and whatnot. He can't talk, he can't speak. The day the Vanderkoys killed my family and left me deaf and mute. Um, and so that's kind of his, his inner, inner monologue voice. And uh, this one was just, it was interesting, it was wacky. Not the greatest movie, but it was just so wacky and a lot of the, the action stuff and what it's doing. And so this one was just crazy, wild, and enjoyable uh, from, you know, from a lot of it. And it's, uh, it has definitely has some memorable moments from it. Uh, I think I heard about this from reviewers who were just kind of uh, mentioning the, the movie and I was like, huh, that's an interesting movie. So I went and saw it. It's pretty interesting, pretty fun. I enjoyed it. Uh, number nine, we have Argyle. Now this one, I know a lot of people were kind of pissed off about this one. Uh, they really didn't like it. For me, because I guess a lot of some of these movies, you just have to have like the right perspective going into it. And for the Argyle, if you're going into this movie thinking it's going to be like a spy espionage thriller, stop. Don't go into it thinking like that. Uh, to me, I see it as a comedy. Um, like, like just a straight up comedy. Like a parody of the spy thriller. Because it has a ridiculous number of plot twists in this movie. A ridiculous number of plot twists. So many plot twists to the point where it just became like every time there was a plot twist it had me laughing because it was basically a running joke all the plot twists and it was just like oh how are we going to get out of this situation i don't know throw in a plot twist or something like that it, re it really felt like the writers were just like okay what's the most ridiculous thing we could possibly have happen here do that and that's that's to me that's what this movie was. is this supposed to be a comedy i don't think so it doesn't really seem like it's supposed to be a parody. I don't know if I've, I don't think I've really seen people advertise this movie as a parody. But to me, when I was watching it, it just was so funny. It was, it was like a parody to me. That's how I see this movie. Uh, I just really enjoyed it. It was ridiculous. Um, but like not everybody was looking at it like that. But yeah, that's why it goes a little bit higher on my list. Uh, number eight we have the bike riders i was interested in seeing it because it has austin butler and tom hardy in it and it honestly it's kind of really cool it's a uh it's a 60s movie um that's or it takes place in the 60s uh, about a biker gang or kind of like a biking biker club that turns into a biker gang um, by the end of the movie and so it's kind of like the rise and fall of a, of a biker gang and uh, I think I think it has a lot of has a lot of aesthetics in the mood of a like 60s and 70s kind of era, and uh, I think I just think like the kind of like the vibes of the movie was just really cool and uh, kind of made me kind of I kind of looked up the I was like I was like is this gang real you know because uh, it's based off of a book um, that that someone wrote 
uh, based on like a, a real biker gang. So uh, somebody wrote a book about a Midwestern biker gang, um, and this was basically about the guy who was writing the book about a biker gang, except for this bike, biker gang specifically is kind of fictional. So um, I, th I just thought that was, I, I thought it was really good. I really enjoyed this one. Um, number seven is the Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare. Now, um, as I've been going through and watching a bunch of, um, I've got a, a top 100 movies list, and uh, well, there's uh, quite a few Guy Ritchie movies on that list. As I've been watching through them, I haven't really been a fan of Guy Ritchie movies. They are really weird, and um, it, to the it, it just a lot of the stuff just doesn't stick in my head because it, it gets really weird. They're interesting movies, um, but they just they're so wacky, and a lot of stuff happens in to the point where like a lot of it just doesn't stick in my head. So I just I'm not a really huge fan of those. I like Ministry of Un I think that's Ministry of Ungentlemanly Warfare is probably my favorite Guy Ritchie movie. Um, I really liked this one. Uh, I liked uh, you had uh, Henry Cavill in it and a lot of a lot of other actors. I don't remember their names, but um, a lot of memorable actors in there. Um, some memorable scenes in there. Um, some really fun uh, action in the movie. And this one was just it was bloody good time. And you have some and it's apparently based on a true story. Uh, not a whole lot of it is true, I'm sure. Uh, but you've got some spy espionage. You've got some uh, really cool action, really fun, creative action in the movie. Um, and so I, I really enjoyed this one as well. Um, number six, we have The Fall Guy. And this movie is the was the kickoff to the summer blockbuster season. Um, unfortunately, it has not been... A lot of these movies have not been very successful at the, at the box office, even though I do find them to be quite enjoyable. Um, but The Fall Guy is kind of, it's kind of like an all-encompassing movie with, you've got romance, you've got action, you've got comedy, you've got Ryan Gosling and Emily Blunt. It's just, and it's a celebration of stuntmen um, in general on, uh, in Hollywood because they don't get a lot of credit. And I found this movie to be a lot of fun. I enjoyed it. Um, it has, it's kind of more of an all-around, so it, I don't have as much passion about like um, as I would with some other movies on this list. Um, so I, I very much enjoyed it. This was one I was definitely very much looking forward to watching, and it was definitely kind of meant to. It was definitely kind of meant to be kind of like an, an appealing movie to a broad audience, which I usually find can be entertaining, but at the end of the day can be a little bit more like, eh, you know. Um, obviously this one's pretty high on my list, so uh, I did very much enjoy it. Um, before I get into my top five, go ahead and put down in the comments below what movies have you watched this year and how would you rank them? And if you guys like this video and want me to do more videos ranking stuff, uh, let me know down in the comments below or hit the like button to show that you guys enjoy this video. Alrighty, number five, we have Inside Out 2. Um, this movie, now, I really liked, Inside, like, um, there's kind of, I would say, but there's probably a relatively large distance between uh, five and six. Um, and Inside Out 2, is like it was just really good and it, the only reason why it comes down at number five is because it's not quite my style of movie that i typically enjoy um i typically enjoy like the more action and um related movies and this is a more family friendly movie or, or a more family movie and so that's kind of why it goes a little bit lower down on my list just because it's not my type of movie um but i really did enjoy it now I used to not like Inside Out, and then I rewatched it in preparation for Inside Out 2, and I was like, oh my gosh, Inside Out's really good, and we're gonna watch Inside Out 2, that's really good. And so I really enjoyed uh, the Inside Out 2, and it, the way it does everything, it's probably the best Pixar movie, I mean, it definitely is the best Pixar movie that has come out in many, many years. Um, so this is just this was a great kind of refreshing that it was actually a good Pixar movie instead of being like another disappointing like oh, it was mediocre it was fine or you know a disappointing sequel it's a sequel that rivals the original uh, at number four we have Furiosa a Mad Max saga and uh, this one I've I just recently got into the Mad Max 
Uh, I've got a bunch of videos on my channel where I uh, talk about Mad Max, Mad Max Fury Road, and then Furiosa as well. And I recently got into the franchise because Furiosa was coming out. Um, it was, it was kind of really the, um, I actually didn't really know like much about the Mad Max franchise. And I saw the trailer and I was like, I gotta see that. I'm like, I'm sold on that. And uh, so then I w went and watched all the Mad Max movies. I really, I, I very much enjoy the franchise and going to see this movie, I really enjoyed it. It took me a little while because it's, it's a movie that spans across um, Furiosa's life instead of just taking place in a small chunk. It takes place her over her entire life. This is the backstory of Furiosa from Mad Max Fury Road. So it's kind of a little bit of a prequel. And um, so I, I kind of like, I'm not really a fan of those types of movies, but, re, but like it was aging well and then I had to rewatch it to kind of get a better like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. So kind of have to process that movie a little bit more. Uh, but I really did enjoy that movie. It's really good. It's a very solid movie um, to include in the Mad Max franchise. Uh, number three is a horror movie, Abigail. And this movie was definitely a surprise. I didn't really know about it at first. And it's basically a vampire ballerina in a mansion. That's basically your entire premise. But, and like, I'm not usually a big fan of like. Like, I can enjoy horror movies, kind of. Like, I, most horror movies that I watch, they're not really suspenseful or anything like that because they don't have characters that really make you care about them at all. And so, you know, I'm, I'll, I'll just watch, like, I'm watching horror movies and whatnot, and I'm just like, it's fine. I'm not, like, a huge fan of them or anything like that. I found Jurassic Park to be uh, a much more suspenseful movie than most horror movies. And with Abigail, this was like, wow. Like, I was impressed because they actually, you actually, like, like some of my favorite characters were killed off, which isn't, isn't usually a sentence I would say in a horror movie because I don't usually have favorite characters. Um, but I, there was a couple of characters that I really liked and they got killed off and that kind of made me sad. And I was really happy when the, uh, when the person who survived uh, didn't die. I was like, oh my gosh, thank goodness <laughs> that she survived. And then they also did some things in the climax, like, the, like towards the end, that um, like, like they were kind of like, hey, maybe we'll go this direction. And I was like, oh my gosh, yes, go that direction, go that direction. And it's a very unconventional direction. And they did that, and I was super happy about it. So this had like a bunch of roller coaster of emotions, a lot of things that you would want from a movie that you don't typically get from a horror movie. And that just put it really high up on my list. Uh, for, for a long period of time, it was number two on my list, but the movie that ended up taking that number two spot was Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. Now, this is the first Planet of the Apes movie I ever saw. I never saw a Planet of the Apes movie until this movie came out. And uh, so a coworker kind of convinced me to go watch this movie. And I went to see the movie and I was like, wow. Because I, I never really was too interested in the Planet of the Apes concept. And I watched the movie and I was like, wow, this is actually pretty good. And especially considering this movie is more about legacy. So, um, you know, they're talking about Caesar from the previous trilogy. Um, and it's like 300 years in the future. And it's kind of like watching A New Hope, you know, like Star Wars A New Hope. And like where you've got like all this lore and everything like that about these characters. But coming in and seeing this movie first, I don't know any of that lore. So that's really fascinating. It's like, oh, cool. We've got all this lore and stuff that they're teasing. And then I went back and watched all of the Planet of the Apes movies, all, uh, all five of the um, original 70s movies, and then you have the 2001 remake, and then the most recent trilogy, and then I went back and rewatched uh, Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. And like then, having all that extra context, then I was able to appreciate Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes on another level, having rewatched, having watched everything else. So I, you can watch that movie with zero knowledge of the franchise and having watched all the other movies and you can appreciate them in different ways. And so because of that, I really liked it. But obviously not enough to put it at number one because number one is Dune part two. And this movie, I think when I made a review about it, I called it the most epic movie of the decade. And I stand by that, you know, uh, Dune part two was 
this huge spectacle of a movie with really cool, like, it was just a whole vibe. It was a whole thing. Really, really good. Uh, my favorite scene in that movie is just, it, it is just something that is just stri like striking images um, from that. And I had to go, see, and this is in the, the third movie that I rewatched in theaters. Um, cause I, I, I watched, Do I rewatched Dune and then I watched Dune part two for the first time. And then after that, I went back and I watched, um, the 1984 movie. And then I watched the 2000 mini series, um, from the sci-fi channel. And then I rewatched Dune part two, kind of get it all together. And yeah, this movie just absolutely killed it. Absolutely nailed it. I am excited for the, uh, I don't remember what they call the third movie or the third, the sequel to this. Um, make it a trilogy and hopefully, maybe just stop there. Just stop at the trilogy. Just kind of keep it. This is, to me, this kind of feels like our Lord, of, my generation's Lord of the Rings. I was, I, I was a baby when Lord of the Rings came out. I was not by no means old enough to watch Lord of the Rings when it came out in theaters. So to me, this is like my Lord of the Rings. It's like these perfect, like these, technically perfect movies that you really could not do any better and that's what this is to me this is kind of my 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 lord of the rings uh my generation's lord of the rings coming in and seeing dune um lord of the rings is like a perfect trilogy absolutely amazing is the dune is the dune trilogy going to be as perfect absolutely not because the first movie i find to be significantly weaker than the second one but to me Dune Part 2 is the best movie I have seen in theaters all year, and that is my list. If you guys enjoyed this, definitely go ahead and hit the like button, and thank you for sticking around for the end of the video, and uh, by the end of the year, I probably will do a full 2024 ranking list of all the movies. I don't even know how many movies I will see in July through December. We'll see how many I watch. Um, this, movie, this could easily double. So it could be 32 movies by the end of the year. Who knows? We'll never know uh, until it happens. So thank you guys so much for watching, and we'll see you guys in the next episode. Ciao.